Okay. Well, I would like to thank the organizers first for organizing a very, uh, uh, in my view, uh, unusual and interesting and thought-provoking gathering, uh, and for the invitation to speak as well. And I would like to thank the other speakers for uh, introducing the topics that I will talk about, and, and uh, well, they made my job uh, uh, very simple. So the title of this talk refers to string theory, uh, clearly, uh, but what I will talk about is quantum field theory. Um, quantum field theory has, um, uh, well, the points that I will make about quantum field theory is that uh, a lot can be learned uh, by viewing cosmological models in the framework of, of effective field theory. Um, so there are, in particular, the two messages uh, of this talk, um, and they're quite simple to state, so I'll do so right away. The first message is um, that with, with the development over the past 15 years of, of general compactifications in string theory, it became clear that uh, there are also many low energy effective field theories coming from these compactifications, and uh, quite possibly a large number of vacua as well coming from them. Um, this has uh, provided a framework uh, for possibly realizing and, and concretizing earlier ideas about uh, the anthropic solution to the cosmological constant problem in a fundamental physics framework. Um, related to this and contrary to this perhaps, it's sometimes said that string theory then, by using this anthropic principle, has ceased to make uh, any observational uh, predictions. There are many aspects of, of that argument that are worthwhile discussing. Here I will just focus on one. Namely, the, the point that I will make is that there are upcoming observations, astrono astronomical observations, that can rule out the application of the anthropic principle as a solution to the cosmological constant problem in the known string theory landscape. Um, so this is a, a problem of, of some conceptual interest, if, if not uh, practical interest. The second point that I will make is that um, the rules of quantum field theory are extremely well tested. Um, for QED, we have a precision of uh, one part in 10 to the 8 for uh, observables that, that have been computed and tested in the lab. Um, for cosmological models, we come and use classical tools. So we use classical low energy <coughs> field theory to derive model, to set up models and cons consider the consequences of these models. Uh, this can lead to some misconceptions and perhaps skewed views of what's natural and, and not natural. So what I will argue is that uh, popular dark energy models uh, commonly make the cosmological constant problem worse, not, not better. The framework for discussing naturalness, in my view, uh, is to use the modern view of, particle, mod, modern view of quantum field theory of renormalization, as was developed by Ken Wilson and others, um, Ken here uh, depicted celebrating a, a weekend trip he will soon do to Stockholm together with Hans Peter. So in, in Wilsonian effective field theory, the, the, well, at the heart of the idea is that each set of scales, we can define a set of variables that are appropriate for that scale, and we can describe physics in terms of these variables without having to uh, always have to describe the, the whole set of physics, the whole underlying uh, um, rules and laws of physics. So we can describe Newtonian physics without knowing quantum mechanics. We can do atomic physics and nuclear physics without knowing quantum gravity. That appears to be the way the world works. Wilsonian effective field theory formalizes this, uh, basically by saying that if you have some theory with both light and, and heavy fields that is valid below some, some UV cutoff, some high scale cutoff, uh, you can get from this theory to a low energy description if you're only interested in very low energies uh, in which the, only the light fields are relevant by integrating out the heavy fields. Uh, this integrating out leads an, to an effective potential for the light fields, which captures just the same physics as the whole, including the whole tower would have done, uh, but we never have to refer to the heavy fields. And if we're only interested in energies much below the cutoff scale, this, uh, uh, act, this effective theory will be uh, local and can be, say if it's a scalar field, it can be Taylor expanded in the field, like so. Um, so in, in this uh, effective Lagrangian, 
uh, we have some coefficients here, dimensionless coefficients called uh, Wilson coefficients. They're in general scale dependent, dependent on the scale lambda. Uh, we have the scale lambda. And then we have a, a tower of modes going from uh, n equals zero to infinity. For values of n, so powers of n greater than four, these operators are called irrelevant. If they're less than four, they're called relevant. And if they're at n, just exactly four, they're called marginal. And they're, they're called this for a good reason. Uh, if we look at the, say, a set of irrelevant operators, or here, actually, a, a, marginal, a marginal operator uh, and an irrelevant operator, the five to the sixth operator. And we do this uh, running of the coupling, so we see how the C couplings evolve as we decrease in energy. Uh, if we start from uh, at high energies with quite different theories, so different theories with different values of this uh, uh, C4 couplings, they all very quickly, with just a little bit of running, a couple of decades, uh, arrive to the same sort of attractor uh, renormalization group uh, line. So the boundary condition at very high energy is completely irrelevant at low energies. We don't care about it. It doesn't affect any physics. And that's why these operators are called irrelevant. The situation is very different for the operators that had n less than 4. See so here, the picture the C0 and C2, so a mass term and a, uh, basically a cosmological constant of vacuum energy term. Here I can start very close to zero, but just slightly different initial conditions, and these RG trajectories, as they're called, will diverge. And uh, low energy physics, as measured out here, is extremely sensitive to whatever the UV boundary conditions uh, are. So this is in the Wilsonian picture. When we actually do computation in quantum field theory, we <coughs> typically use the continuum picture. We send a UV cut up to infinity. Um, and then we use, say, a, a hard cutoff that we send to infinity or dimensional regularization. And in this picture, which is sort of the picture that you teach, perhaps if you teach quantum field theory, a first course in quantum field theory, um, the UV sensitivity becomes manifest through loop corrections. So for example, the vacuum energy, if I have a, if I want to compute the one loop correction to the vacuum energy and I have a scalar of mass m in the theory, and I use dimensionally, dimensional regularization, uh, I find a, a couple of, of contribution. Uh, first, I will have some divergent part here. Uh, if I would use a hard cutoff, this would be the part that would scale like lambda to the fourth. Um, it's not a, a physical part. It's, it corresponds to this the uh, UV cutoff taken to infinity. Um, we have a physical part, which is proportional to the log of the renormalization group scale mu here, which is the scale at basically which we measure the physics. Um, and then there's a counter term, which is supposed to cancel out the divergent part and some of the finite parts, and which we'll use to actually set the value for rho at low energies to what we observe. So here, uh, the, the UV sensitivity of relevant operators, so rho is a relevant operator, uh, and it's UV sensitivity because the mass parameter appears here in a physical contribution. Um, so any state that I have in the theory will contribute to rho, and uh, I will be very, very sensitive to what precisely that value of that mass is. So this, of course, leads to the cosmological constant problem. Uh, generically, each species contributes to, to this, this vacuum energy. And the vacuum energy um, uh, gives rise to a, a contribution in the stress energy tensor that um, uh, well, contributes effectively to the cosmological constant. Um, so the full cosmological constant will be whatever bare contribution I had plus some vacuum energy uh, contribution. So uh, at low energies, and I mean, as always in quantum field theory, we, we, uh, we fix the masses and the parameters by matching to experiment at low energies. And then once we've fixed those uh, uh, masses and parameters, we go out and, and test the theory. So the, 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 the fixing of the parameters is the renormalization group condition. And for the vacuum energy, it's just that we fix the vacuum energy at low energy. So basically, we fix this whole thing to be equal to the observed cosmological constant. Now, th this is uh, the operational and, and true meaning of fine tuning in quantum field theory. Uh, we have contributions that are proportional to the mass scale to the fourth power divided by our loop factor of four pi squared. 
and, and this is the quantity that we have to cancel out uh, in this expression um, in order to get something that's a order of the observed uh, value. So if we only had masses that were of order of the observed energy, uh, observed vacuum energy, we would have no fine tuning. F lambda would be one. If there is a hierarchy, uh, we will get some fine tuning. So this way, one can get um, the, the classical numbers. Suppose that there's nothing else in the universe except the standard model. Um, we know quantum field theory and, and, and gravity breaks down at the Planck scale, but suppose some Planck mystery makes, uh, no, gives no contribution up there. Then we know that we at least have 53 orders of magnitude in fine tuning for the cosmological constant. Um, this would, for instance, be the case um, if we have supersymmetry kicking in just around the, the top scale, then that would help, uh, uh, that, that would no, give no more uh, fine tuning for at higher energies. Um, but we, we could be uh, in the case where we have states up to the Planck scale and that will contribute to the vacuum energy. Um, so in cosmology and, and sort of late time cosmological models, so dark energy models, quintessence models and so, are at least implicitly Wilsonian effective the field theories valid at very low energies. Um, so this would be energy, say, less than uh, the uh, milli electron volts. And there are well-known challenges to, to construct such models. Um, uh, you know, if I introduce a scalar particles, it can mediate fixed forces. It can give a violation of the equivalence principle. Um, uh, these particles will not necessarily automatically be, be stable to quantum corrections. Uh, and it also, they, they don't, of course, solve the cosmological constant problem because, I mean, that just doesn't go away because I introduced a, a new scalar particle that's light. I still have the electron in my theory. The electron will give a contribution to the vacuum energy density. I still have the top quark. So uh, if I want this other field to cause the acceleration of the universe, uh, what people effectively do is that they set the effective cosmological constant to zero and let the other field do the work. That basically is the condition that we take the, uh, the fine tuning to be larger uh, than what we had in a cosmological constant problem because this RG condition will involve a higher degree of cancellations. Uh, the uh, talk, a topic that I will also uh, come back to is that the interactions between dark matter and dark energy uh, further increase the, the fine tuning. Okay, so as an example, just to make this concrete, uh, because I mean, it is an issue for known particles, for known processes, and sort of in the most basic quantum field theory that we, we know of, um, one can consider varying alpha and what happens with the vacuum energy. So uh, the vacuum energy depends on, on the fine structure constant alpha through loop corrections. So for instance, this diagram will contrib contribute to the uh, uh, vacuum energy and it comes with a power of alpha and I have some tower of, uh, uh, of contributions that depend on increasingly higher orders of alpha. So I can expand the vacuum energy in, in loops like this. So all of these contributions will be proportional to the mass of the particle running in the loop to the fourth power. There'll be some order one coefficient, some loop factors, and then alpha, the yeah, one power of alpha for each loop, for, for each uh, photon height. Um, so again, um, what, what we usually do is, of course, that we set the vacuum energy density uh, equal to the observed vacuum energy density in a renormalization condition or when we do flat space quantum field theory, we set it to zero. Um, now, suppose I've done this, and I just by hand, so no physical mechanism, but just to see the, the point, I make a, a variation of alpha. So I take a vary alpha from the renormalized value for which this equation holds to the renormalized value plus a small perturbation. Then the vacuum energy density up here will get a contribution which to leading order is delta alpha times this mass scale to the fourth power. Now, if this mass scale is much, much larger than delta rho, uh, this is a very large contribution to the vacuum energy density. So for instance, uh, if we take this mass scale to be the top, top mass scale and we make a, a perturbation of alpha one part in a million, the change in the vacuum energy density compared to the observed uh, vacuum energy density scale is 59, 49 uh, orders of magnitude which is, I mean, obviously not feasible with, with cosmology. 
Um, so what, what, we what, what one can implicitly do when one writes down cosmological models of varying alpha is to make sure that the potential for this field is flat. But once we've written down a model, like sort of a low energy model with a, with a, a flat classical potential, what we've done is that we've assumed that these quantum contributions have canceled against some other bare contribution in our potential. And this can be done, uh, but at a cost, uh, because the potential will then need to be fine-tuned, not only the zeroth order term, but also the linear term, the mass term, the higher order terms. So uh, just to make this explicit, so the effective potential, which would be the one that one would write down at low energies, would contain the, the vacuum energy, say the, the value at delta chi equals zero, uh, some potential, some bare potential for the field, and then all these loop corrections that, that will be of this form. Here with C sub k being order one. Um, so the notation here is, okay, so that's the vacuum energy density. These are the contributions from the alpha dependent loops. Delta alpha m here is the maximum uh, value of the, this excursion. So 10 to the minus six times alpha in the previous example. Delta chi m is the maximal field excursion and this is the compensating potential. So Banks, Stein, and Douglas considered this case for uh, a variation of alpha or one part in 10 to the minus, one part in 10 to the four um, many years ago. And they, they argued that at least all orders up to the eighth order in this expansion has to be fine tuned in order to be consistent with basic observations. So th this is just the cosmological constant problem again, we're tuning the vacuum energy density um, so, so it's, it's fair to say that this is a, exacerbates the cosmological constant problem. So that one can you know, just compute the fine tuning, uh, just seeing how much we have to tune the zero order term, the linear term, the higher order terms. Uh, there will be three parameters that, that appear there. First, um, if we vary the vacuum energy, then say alpha varies over some redshift range. Say. Um, we have to decide how, how large a vacuum energy density we can allow, say, at redshift of three. Uh, we won't be able to allow sort of an electron mass to the fourth power, but it will be some, some value that we'll be able to allow. So that's rho sub m. Uh, there'll be some large value, which is this um, a mass scale to the fourth power divided by a loop factor, divided by this uh, maximum allowable energy density. And then there's some small number uh, delta parameter, which is basically the, the change in alpha divided by four pi. So one can compute the, the total fine tuning then by, which is just, I mean, you have to fine tune a zeroth order term, then the first order term, second order, third, third fourth, up to at least eighth, eighth order. So that, that's a, you know, a product one can do. The expression looks like, like this. Uh, and it's, it's um, from at least this expression, uh, one can see that it's, it's roughly, well, it's, 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 it's an exponential, uh, in uh, uh, where, where the base is, is this large number. So, so how much worse is this? Well, for if we take this variation to be one part in a million, and we set that uh, the maximum allowable energy density will should not be larger than say the matter density at redshift three it has to be concrete. Um, then the fine tuning will be 121 orders of magnitude worse in the case that the m is equal to m top and 677 orders of magnitude worse. If, if the m is all the way up to Planck scale. So if we compare these models in a plot, here is the ordinary cosmological constant problem running from 53 here to 120 roughly. Uh, and then we have this other curve for varying alpha for this, with delta alpha over alpha is 10 to the minus six. Now, uh, th this is perhaps not the, the immediate question that we would all ask. Uh, but it will be, become clear, perhaps, in, 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 in a bit, what, why I, I asked this question. So could it be worse? Are there other models that make the cosmological constant problem even worse? Um, and do they have distinctive observational signatures? And there are. Uh, um, interacting dark energy models are a class of models that, um, that, that allow for very, very fine, high fine tunings. So interacting dark energy models uh, uh, refers to models in which the dark energy sector interacts with dark matter. Um, they're often suggested to be natural, because why shouldn't dark energy interact with dark matter? And, and possibly key to explaining the cosmic coincidence of why uh, the, 
and uh, omega lambda and omega m are of the same order of magnitude. So they're typically studied at the level of, of cosmological fluid dynamics, just inserting heat in one and reducing it from another. And in microscopic realization, what they involve is, is typically a dark energy field modifying the mass of the dark matter particle. So in general, uh, this, as in the cosmological constant problem, involves a coupling of heavy states uh, to light states. Or sorry, I should. In general, this involves a coupling of heavy states to light states, and it leads to um, additional violations of decoupling and, and additional fine tuning. Um, so just as the cosmological constant problem is a violation of decoupling. So to consider an illuminating uh, example of how much worse the fine tuning could be, uh, we can consider P dark matter particles, just take them to be scalar fields with some mass m, some quartic interactions, sort of mutually interacting dark matter scalar fields. And then this potential will receive corrections at each loop order that we can compute. Um, and uh, well, the uh, loop diagrams look like this. And the mass parameter to one first loop, it just, we just get m to the fourth for each of the fields, and then the interactions kick in, and we get more and more complicated dependence on the different masses. So the vacuum energy is renormalized to the observed uh, value uh, for the, reno the low energy renormalization group scale and the masses that we observe, so the renormalized masses. Um, so this is the same condition. So this is the, basically the cosmological constant problem unchanged again. Um, now, suppose we, we do something to this model. And so far, it's just dark matter models, the dark matter particles. But suppose that we have P dark energy fields that sources independently variation in each of the P dark matter states. So I, I induce some fractional variation in each of these states. And just for simplicity, I'll take the ith dark matter state to depend on the ith dark energy field. Just, um, it, it becomes simpler to, to express um, the, uh, the, the theory that way. Then at low energies, we have an effective potential for the dark energy fields. Um, and the effective potential uh, will be uh, given by, well, loop corrections, which will be of the same order as before. So m to the fourth divided by some loop factor. And then I will get all these variations coming in. And these have to be then canceled by some bare contribution. Now, if I if these dark energy fields explore a, a more than one-dimensional volume in field space, the fine-tuning of, of these models become truly uh, excessive. So uh, again, one can compute it uh, analytically. Um, so th this is the, the sum that one has to do, at least if, if we take the variation to be of the same order of magnitude for all these different fields. Um, and and one can get a closed-form expression for it, which is fortunate because the numbers start to be too large to, to do in a feasible way on a computer. Um, so this is an example taking the mass scale of the dark matter particle around 100 GeV, so a, a typical dark matter mass range. Um, and what, what is plotted here is, the, is a 10 log of the fine tuning. Um, so here, if we start from very, very small variations in one field, we have just slightly more than a, uh, a well, we, we have 10 to the 120 or so in fine tuning for the cosmological constant problem. As this variation increases, uh, to be a, you know, 10% or so, we get 10 to the um, 600 or so, and then it, it diverges. And if we have more fields that are varying in, in field space, uh, this fine tuning can become truly excessive. So, for instance, if we have them for this mass scale, and I have three fields that vary, three dark matter fields, their masses vary by 25%, uh, the, the fine tuning um, becomes 10 to the 10 to the 6. So that's, that's a large number. Okay, so wh why study these models? So I've, I've studied increasingly more uh, fine-tuned models and made a problem uh, worse. Um, so the reason uh, why I, I, I thought this was uh, a little bit fun was that uh, it's, it's because of anthropics and the application of the anthropic principle in, in string theory. So uh, in, a, in a simple way, we've heard more uh, a more, more clear explanation of anthropic principle this morning, but um, if we take anthropics to mean that if there wasn't a detailed cancellation of the vacuum energy density, we wouldn't be here to observe it. Um, so uh, anthropic reasoning can be realized in fundamental theory, but doing so requires three features of the theory. 
So the, the theory must have many vacua that scan the effective cosmological constant over the interesting range. So many here means that the number of vacua that we need uh, will need to be larger than whatever fine tuning we had in the theory. So if we don't have enough vacua, uh, then this, it's hard to argue that just by chance one of them would just happen to have the right value. And the second uh, uh, of all, the theory must somehow sample these vacua. And third, the observed cosmological constant should, after we've done, you know, computed how the sampling of these many vacua occurred, uh, the observed cosmological constant should be uh, rather typical. So string theory has been proposed to realize uh, point one through flux compactifications um, and two or three through internal uh, inflation and, and quantum cosmology, as we heard a talk on uh, earlier today. So here, um, I will just focus on, on this point, because it's the simplest one. It's the one that we can ask just in the theory itself. Um, string theory has many vacua, apparently. There are a couple of ways these many vacua come about. First of all, we can compactify on many different manifolds. Uh, so this is a, a plot of the different uh, Calabria of threefolds, so a particular six-dimensional type of manifold that one can compactify on to go from ten dimensions to four dimensions. Um, what's plotted on the x-axis is the, uh, some topological numbers of these uh, compactification manifolds. So each dot corresponds to one or more manifolds. There are uh, many of them. But uh, more than so, it's not just that we have many different compactification manifolds, but each compactification manifold has typically non-trivial cycles, and on these cycles, um, one can turn on flux. So basically, uh, electromagnetic, well, ma magnetic field lines wrapping the internal cycles. If you have many cycles, you can do that in many ways. And you can also turn on different integer number of flux along each cycle. So it becomes an exponentially large number. The number of vacua has been estimated um, by, well, starting with work from Ashok and, and Douglas, and uh, uh, what one is actually estimating is, with these estimates is the number of supersymmetric vacua. So there are no reliable estimates of the number of the sitter vacua uh, yet. Um, and just to, to give you an example of, of well, where these numbers come from that are typically talked about. Um, so for compactification on, on a manifold called CP11169, one finds awarded 10 to the 506 flux vacua, or I should say flux configurations. Uh, so low energy effective field theories. Uh, last year, um, Taylor and Wong uh, considered an F-theory compactification where you have 10 to the 272,000 low energy effective theories. This is, was argued to be the manifold that dominated the string landscape in the sense that uh, this manifold gives rise to the vast majority of all flux compactification, compactifications. All other compactifications together <coughs> Uh, contributes with 10 to the minus 3,000 compared to the, uh, the number of um, um, flux compactifications on, on that manifold. Now, so, so perhaps now it, it becomes clear uh, why I was considering these models. So if one would find evidence for these models that have a fine tuning more than say 10 to the 500 or 10 to the 506, uh, these models would be too fine tuned to be able to realize the first criterion uh, of, of realizing the anthropic principle in a fundamental theory, namely that the number of vacua would just not be enough. Uh, we would have, uh, even if you had 200 to 506 vacua, you would have a larger fine tuning than that, and you couldn't realize the anthropic principle. Uh, furthermore, the, the quite excessive ones up here uh, would be even too fine tuned for, uh, for F theory compactifications with, say, a word of 10 to the 272,000 vacua. So if we would have evidence for these highly fine-tuned models, that would be evidence against the anthropic solution in the known string theory landscape. So geometric compactification on type 2B or F theory. So the question is then, uh, you know, we would have to know about it. We would have to know that these models exist and are realized in nature. Otherwise, uh, we, we couldn't rule out uh, the anthropic principle in string theory. Uh, and these models can have observable signals. Uh, for instance, they allow for a, a decay of these dark matter states into two photons. 
and as such, they can, in principle, be discovered. So, for instance, we look at a cluster in this direction, and we see some spectrum of, of, of three states. And we, we're unidentified, and we exclaim that they're dark matter states. And then if we look at a different cluster in a different direction, we see the same three states, but they've moved, the lines have moved around a bit. And then we might repeat the experiment, and we see these lines uh, um, um, well, move around uh, over, over the sky. Now, this would be evidence that we would have found a state and that their masses are moving around, so it's evidence for some fine-tuned model. Uh, but it wouldn't necessarily be evidence for some of these very, very fine-tuned models that I was discussing before, uh, because I can really do something like this with just a one scalar field. Say I have two masses, I can vary both of them with just a single field uh, vari variation, so a single parameter variation. Um, if we would find some data like, like this, on the other hand, uh, this one can argue and make very clear um, cannot be realized with a small field variation of a single field. And large field variations of a single field will be uh, formally infinitely fine-tuned. So the most conservative explanation of, of some data like this would be that you would have many fields uh, that are uh, varying masses. And, and that could then be, uh, would then be evidence for these very, very fine-tuned models. Okay. And there are, of course, additional model-dependent signals coming from, say, a large-scale structure. Um, but that, uh, uh, let me close there. Okay, so I made two points. Uh, the first one is that upcoming observations can, can in principle rule out the anthropic solution to the cosmological constant problem in the known string theory landscape. And the second problem was just to, to look at popular dark energy models and, and argue that these typically made the cosmological constant problem worse, not better. Uh, and just to make a, a few points that are perhaps more general than, than this talk. Um, so I think that the existence of a large set of apparently consistent, long-lived uh, string vacua profoundly affects physics questions of, of fundamental importance. And understanding the properties of these string vacua is technically very challenging. Uh, but progress continues to be made, even though this is sort of far from the matting crowds. It's, it's the, most of the work on this is, is not um, uh, what one typically sees in the media and, and from most opinionated uh, people. Um, while complicated, uh, string theory is a restrictive framework, and vacuum are not just random when you're in, in the low energy limit. So it's, it's quite possible for substan substantial progress uh, in this field along many lines. So, all right, thanks. Time for a couple of brief questions. So I have a question about uh, dark matter, since you were using it to prove uh, the, the landscape. So uh, I wonder how much the, this kind of proof would be related to a particular choice. How generic is the dark matter that you are uh, considering? Uh, so I, I don't think these models are generic at all, quite the opposite. Um, they're very fine-tuned. Uh, having dark matter masses at the range of 100 GeV uh, it's, it's not particularly fine-tuned. So, so if I understand correctly, if, uh, so if you don't see any signature uh, of the kind that you were showing us, you can always argue that there, there is not the right kind of dark matter for make this proof? Yeah, so, so the, the argument goes, so what we want to do is to exclude something observationally. So we want to find observational evidence that is contrary to the predictions of, of some model. And what I argued was that there is a prediction. It's a very weak prediction. But we can actually construct models that are so fine-tuned that have observational signals that are detectable uh, so that we can actually rule out uh, uh, a theory. Both you and the previous speaker mentioned both the cosmological constant and inflation. Uh, if the observations are correct and then the flash correct, that means the, our universe <coughs> exper has experienced twice acceleration at the very beginning and now talking about coincidences do you think that the two are connected in any way um, <coughs> not not in an obvious way no. um, so I mean the 
for all evidence for the vacuum energy now is that it's quite different from what inflation was. Inflation we had, and uh, well, it, it wasn't just a vacuum, right? We we have we don't have n s equals one. We actually have n s less than one. We know that it was a slow roll evolution. So it's not like we were sitting in the bottom of a potential then, and we're sitting at the bottom of a potential now. Um, I mean, it could be, but it's it's. I, I don't think it's. Uh, just because there are two accelerated phases that there's necessarily a, a strong connection or it's that there's even the same physics driving, uh, driving the two phases. Okay, uh, we'll have to bring things to a close here for reasons of time, but let's thank our speaker again.